Hey there, welcome to the YouTube channel. I pray that this message encourages you and it helps you grow and become more like Jesus. And make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can continue to grow and learn more. Enjoy. We're gonna be in Hebrews chapter 11. If you wanna open your Bibles to that, we're beginning a new series called By Faith. By Faith. And today's message is entitled, The Righteous Will Live By Faith. The Righteous Will Live By Faith. Why are we doing this series? Well, how many know, if you're really being honest, when things get hard or you're waiting a long time to see God's promises delivered, your faith can wane a little bit. Your faith can weaken at times. And I'll be completely transparent with you that uh, even as a Christian, a fellow brother in Christ, uh, a pastor in Christ, even my faith can tend to drain. My trust in God has to be renewed from time and time again. And so I'm right there with you. I'm in that journey with you. And we're waiting upon the Lord for him to deliver us, uh, for him to answer our prayers. And so at times, you know, you have to remember the faithfulness of God. And there's no greater chapter I feel like one of the best chapters, I should say, there's many, but one of the best chapters in the Bible is Hebrews 11, where the author, the writer, goes through a list of great examples of people who lived by faith and God showed up and God answered prayers. And then there was also some things that God waited to do as well. And so we wanna take time to look at the faithfulness of God, his character, and I pray that it will renew your faith and that it will build perseverance, it will fuel your perseverance as well as you move into this year that you will hold on to the truth of God's word. And so we're gonna be in Hebrews 11 and we're gonna do something that I don't think we've done yet before on a Sunday. We're gonna read the entire chapter of Hebrews 11 together. So you can check that off your Bible reading plan. I read Hebrews 11. And speaking of that, we have two of them out there for you. We still have copies of these if you want the hard copies. One is chronological order, which is the order of timing of when the books are written. And one is your traditional order. Uh, those are both out there. And we are praying together as a church. So we gave some prayer prompts, seven things to pray about this year. And this has been great. You personalize it for yourself. Personalize it with first person, however you want to. Um, but just, uh, would you join me? and committing to this year praying. And you may forget a day, don't, don't beat yourself up, it's okay. You know, I'm trying to pray for these every day and I have other things I'll pray with this. But you know, just if you could, pray about this on a regular basis, these things. I'm believing that together we will see God answer prayers, amen? Amen. amen. I wanna build faith in this church that God, the God of the impossible will make it possible the God of the impossible would do impossible things and that your faith would increase in him. And we're gonna learn what that means a lot today. What is faith in the context of Hebrews 11? So let's, without further ado, let's read our text. Faith, verse one, is the confidence that what we hope for will actually happen. It gives us assurance about the things we cannot see, through their faith, the people in days of old earned a good reputation. By faith, we understand that the entire universe was formed at God's command, that, when we, that what we now see did not come from anything that can be seen. It was by faith that Abel brought a more acceptable offering to God than Cain did. Abel's offering gave evidence that he was a righteous man, and God showed his approval of his gifts. Although Abel is long dead, he still speaks to us by his example of faith. It was by faith that Enoch was taken up to heaven without dying. He disappeared because God took him. For before he was taken up, he was known as a person who pleased God. And it is impossible to please God without faith. Anyone who wants to come to him must believe that God exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Did I say that this chapter is really powerful yet? Did I, it just, it's so good. Let it just sink in today. It was by faith that Noah built a large boat to save his family from the flood. He obeyed God who warned him about the things that had never happened before. 
By his faith, Noah condemned the rest of the world, and he received the righteousness that comes by faith. It was by faith that Abraham opened, or obeyed when God called him to leave home and go to another land that God would give him as his inheritance. He went without knowing where he was going, and even when he reached the land God promised him, he lived there by faith, for he was like a foreigner living in tents. If you're going through your reading plan, you probably already read that this past week. And so did Isaac and Jacob, who inherited the same promise. Abraham was confidently looking forward to a city with eternal foundations, a city designed and built by God. It was by faith that even Sarah was able to have a child, though she was barren and was too old. She believed that God would keep his promise, and so a whole nation came from this one man, referring to Abraham, and her, who was as good as dead, a nation with so many people like the, or so many people that like the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore, there is no way to count them. All these people died. Now notice this. All these people died, still believing what God had promised them. They did not receive what was promised, but they saw it from a distance and welcomed it. They agreed that they were foreigners and nomads here on earth. Obviously, people who say such things are looking forward to a country they can call their own. If they had longed for the country they came from, they could have gone back. But they were looking for a better place, a heavenly homeland. That is why God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. It was by faith that Abraham offered Isaac a sacrifice when God was testing him. Abraham, who had received God's promises, was ready to sacrifice his only son, Isaac, even though God had told him, Isaac is the son through whom your descendants will be counted. Abraham reasoned that if Isaac died, God was able to bring him back to life again. And in a sense, Abraham did receive his son back from the dead. It was by faith that Isaac promised blessings for the future to his sons, Jacob and Esau. It was by faith that Jacob, when he was old and dying, blessed each of Joseph's sons and bowed in worship as he leaned on his staff. It was by faith that Joseph, when he was about to die, said confidently that the people of Israel would leave Egypt. He even commanded them to take his bones with them when they left. It was by faith that Moses' parents had hid him for three months when he was born. They saw that God had given them an unusual child and they were not afraid to disobey the king's command. It was by faith that Moses, when he grew up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to share the oppression of God's people instead of enjoying the fleeting pleasures of sin. He thought it was better to suffer for the sake of Christ than to own the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking ahead to his great reward. It was by faith that Moses left the land of Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He kept right on going because he kept his eyes on the one who is invisible. Ironic, he kept his eyes on the one who is invisible. It was by faith that Moses commanded the people of Israel to keep the Passover and to sprinkle blood on the doorpost so that the angel of death would not kill their firstborn sons. It was by faith that the people of Israel went right through the Red Sea as though they were on dry ground. But when the Egyptians tried to follow, they were all, they were all drowned. It was by faith that the people of Israel marched around Jericho for seven days and the walls came crashing down. It was by faith that Rahab the prostitute was not destroyed with the people in her city who refused to obey God, for she had given friendly welcome to the spies. How much more do I need to say? It would take too long to recount the stories of the faith of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and all the prophets. By faith, these people overthrew kingdoms, ruled with justice, and received what God had promised them. They shut the mouths of lions, quenched the flames of fire, and escaped death by the edge of the sword. Their weakness was turned to strength. They became strong in battle and put whole armies to flight. Women received their loved ones back again from death. But others were tortured, refusing to turn from God in order to be set free. They placed their hope in a better life after the resurrection. Some were jeered at and their backs were cut open with whips. Others were chained in prisons. Some died by stoning, some were sawed in half, and others were killed with the sword. Some went about wearing skins of sheep and goats, destitute and oppressed and mistreated. They were too good for this world, wandering over deserts and mountains, hiding in caves and holes in the ground. All these people earned a good reputation because of their faith, yet none of them received all that God had promised." 
For God had something better in mind for us so that they would not reach perfection without us. Wow. Amen. And praise God. By faith, what is this faith that we just read about? It's important to understand that in the context of this scripture, in Hebrews 10, the author is encouraging the church to hold on to God, to persevere in the midst of suffering, to not lose faith and to trust God. And so he goes through this beautiful list of, of examples of what God can do if you live by faith. That if you trust him, he will take care of you. But we also see here that some were persecuted, tortured, and died. And so that can kind of mess up some of your thinking, right? Of what it means to believe and trust God. And so we're going to learn about this and we're going to take time to take apart some of these people and their stories in the Old Testament. And I want to start, first of all, though, with the first six verses and really build a foundation for what is faith in this context because it's important you understand that it's not really about saving faith, like to believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. This is after a relationship with him. Do you believe him to be there for you in the midst of everything you're going through? That's the kind of faith we're talking about. And so I might sound redundant today. I might sound like I'm repeating myself, but I want to drive this point home about what is faith, and you'll hear these things as we go through these stories and this series that we're in now. So let me focus on Hebrews 11, 1 through 6, and I want to use the NIV version to answer the question, what is faith? <clears throat> now the NIV version says this, now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. The author here isn't giving us a formal definition of faith here as much as he's connecting his listeners to the type of faith that people had that he uses as an example. So he's not taking the time necessarily to say this is what faith is. He's talking about a hope in a future tense of what is there for them, and they believe that, but also presently in the things they cannot see. So there's a future, and then there's a present reality, and that these people believed that God was taking care of both. Now faith, let me give you another definition, faith is having confidence and trust in God for a future promise that will be inherited and for a spiritual reality that is presently invisible. For instance, his presence with us. So to believe in a future inheritance that's gonna come, to believe that God is going to deliver on one of his promises or all of them, right? We believe all of the ones he has promised, we will receive them and we have to hold on and live by faith. But also we believe in the invisible God working right now and living with us through his Holy Spirit. And exactly, that's exactly my, my example I have. Here's my example personally. I have faith or confident trust that Jesus' blood pardons me from the future wrath of God on judgment day. But I also have faith or confident trust that God's presence is with me now to give me peace and strength. Can anyone else say amen? amen. We have faith that God is going to deliver us in the end, that we will be spared from judgment and from the wrath that's gonna come upon the whole world because Jesus' blood covers over us and forgives us. Now, that's a future reality that we even have right now. We can believe that we have that now. It will be fully realized in the future, so we must believe that and continue to believe that, as Paul says in, in uh, uh, Colossians chapter one. And so we also believe that right now we have that reality and then we also have God's presence with us, just to give you an example of what kind of faith we're talking about here. Faith in Hebrews, another definition or understanding, faith in Hebrews is belief, trust, and confidence in God that enables the believer 
to press on steadfastly whatever the future holds. And let me give you the Greek word for faith here. The Greek word for faith is pistis. It's used 24 times in Hebrews uh, uh, Hebrews 11. It means the sense of confidence, certainty, trust, trustworthiness in God, so to say, a guarantee and assurance in God. And another Greek form is, is pisteo, which means to trust or even to obey, that you trust God so much that you will obey what he says. That's what it means to have faith in this context. In this chapter, faith is man's response to what God has said. So God has said he will do things. Faith is our response that we believe it and that we're willing to obey in the process. It takes seriously the message of God's revealed truth in Holy Scripture. It does not merely agree with God's word, but acts upon it. It's R. Brown, an amazing book I have on Hebrews. Again, my notes are on the website, calvarydover.org, and click on media, and you'll see our after the sermon notes where you can see our notes. I need to read to you two things that faith is, because it's just so powerful. Because faith anticipates the future, but it also evaluates the present. Okay, it believes in the future, but it has eyes to see things in the present too. Spiritual vision in both. Faith anticipates the future. It does not place its reliance on that which is merely visible to our physical sight. You know what I'm saying, right? We don't just place our reliance on what we can see, but what we don't see. It is the assurance of things hoped for. The faithful characters in chapter 11 did not simply live for the passing moment. They realized that there was far more to life than the immediate and temporary scene. Life was a pilgrimage. They knew that there were better things ahead because in one way or another, God had told them so. And they preferred to believe that the word, uh, believe his word rather than the flimsy promises and facile assurances of the world around them. So they chose God's promises that they did not fully see yet over the things that they could see, but they believed the things the world promised was flimsy. It was futile. Now that is the future. And they were willing to go through a lot of stuff to hold on to that, as we read in our scripture today. Secondly, faith evaluates the present. Now this is really important to take away. It would be wrong to imagine that the believer has no interest whatsoever in contemporary life, in everyday life. Indeed, the Christian looks far more closely at the immediate scene or what we can see in front of us than the unbeliever. So we do pay attention to what's in front of us. The person without any clear faith often accepts things simply as they are. If money comes, and this is the examples, if money comes his way, then it is obviously his to enjoy. If he is confronted with an opportunity for sensual pleasure, he will take it, regardless of its immediate effects or ultimate consequences. He does not necessarily sit down to consider whether it damages him or hurts others. That is not his concern. So that's the, that's the, visi- uh, the visible life of someone who's not a believer. Now, what about someone who is a believer? But the man or woman of faith possesses the conviction of things not seen. Such people look beyond the situation as it can be perceived by natural vision or enjoyed by the physical appetites. They do not simply look at their circumstances. They discern the activity of the invisible God in their present situation and are able to endure. So in other words, people of faith look at things like money or the pleasures of the world and they go, what consequences could come? What does God want me to do with these things? We don't just go and do whatever we want because we believe God has a will on earth for us here today. So there's the difference. Those who live by faith have the lens that God sees them, that God has a will for them. God has a desire for them. So when those things come along, what do we do with them? 
How do we handle them? Versus someone who has no framework that God exists, they just think, hey, this is, this is good and this is fine. There's nothing wrong with indulging in these things. So we, we live by faith in the things we do not see, but we live by faith in the things we do see, don't we? We still have to pay attention to what we see and go, what does God want me to do? Are you still with me on that? Because this is what they had to do. This is what Abraham had to do. He had to, he had to believe that God was gonna provide a son even though they were in their 90s. And then he had to look at the things right in front of him and perceive or interpret what he should do, the physical realm. And if you read the story of Abraham and we'll get into his life in the coming weeks, it's interesting the decisions he makes. What about Noah? He's in the middle of the wilderness and he's supposed to build a boat. I don't think that's the place you build it. So just something to think about there. He lived by the faith in the future but had to see things in the reality right in front of him. Interesting. So let's look at our scripture <clears throat> and look at the foundations of faith here because the author here in Hebrews doesn't jump right into examples <clears throat> where people had to take leaps of faith like build a big boat. The author begins with the fundamentals or foundations that lead to living by faith. So the basics of faith. And here they are, number one and number two, faith that God exists and that he created the universe. We learn in this scripture that the righteous believe God exists and he created the universe. Did you know that you believe that? You do, right? Yeah, we kind of take that for granted sometimes, don't we? Because it's so basic. But I work with people and I minister to people, you know, I mentor and help people that don't necessarily believe that yet. So there's a basic or fundamental belief that we have to believe God exists and that he created the universe. And number two, faith seeks, worships, and fellowships with God. And we're gonna see this in, the next, in these six verses, um, and particularly verses three through six, but they're out of order so I wanted to give you those two points in order, but they're gonna be out of order. So let's look at verse three, and uh, if you have your Bibles open still, uh, I'm gonna read it for you. By faith we understand that the entire universe was formed at God's command, that what we now see did not come from anything that can be seen. Uh, this would be creation from nothing but God's word when he spoke things into existence, when he spoke mankind into existence. Now, the secular world would argue, well, that was actually matter, you know, from gases and molecules, and those things, once they got to a certain temperature, created life. And whenever I process those things with people, um, I ask them every time, tell me where the gases and molecules came from. And they always say, well, they always existed. And I'm like, so you're no different than what I'm saying, that God already existed. Interesting. Well, Pastor Ryan or Ryan, whenever they you know, greet me, uh, well, then who created God? Ah, good question. Well, did God have to be created? If he is the creator, he always was and always is and ex existed. That's what we believe because we also have put our faith in the word. Now, when you're talking to someone outside, faith in God and the word, you're not gonna have them believe the same thing. And so they'll reason that something greater or bigger had to create God. And then... I have to listen and you know, gently ask them this question then. Well then who created the greater God that created God? <laughs> and you see their face kind of change a little bit and kind of wondering, well then something created that, right? I don't know, you tell me, you gotta figure it out. What I, I actually have a name for this, I kind of penned it myself, I call it the fallacy of the greater God continuum. 
Just continues. Now, what I help that person understand, I literally have done this in a school here in our community. I've processed this with students and they all kind of, uh, pardon my language, they freaked out when I helped them understand it. It was kind of like mind blowing. What I told them is, if there's a greater God that created the God, then there's a greater, greater God that created the greater God that created the God, that's just gonna keep going. What you did there is you created the eternal God that the Bible says exists. The God that keeps going, that always was and always is, the Alpha and the Omega, the eternal God. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. See, that's exactly who God says he is. He's El. He's God. I am that I am. I, I've always existed. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. He is the beginning, my friends. If you've struggled to believe that today, you have no reason to doubt. God is the beginning. The word says, in the beginning, God created. Notice that tense. God was there already creating everything else. In the beginning, time was not a thing. Time didn't exist until God created the sun and the moon to give us those things. So that, a little science, but I know scientists will argue me, I get it. There's really strong scientists over here to argue this and really strong Christian scientists and theologians and, and philosophers to argue this, but what it comes down to is do we believe? Do we believe? So faith believes God created the universe by his word. Secondly, faith worships God. And I, I may not finish my notes today. I pray I do, but let's try. Faith worships God. Abel is commended as a worshiper of God. Now, he must believe God exists because he knows to worship God. And we believe, scholars believe, that God had instructed Abel and Cain on how to worship. Now, you may have read the story this week. Uh, Abel brings the first uh, of his best flock, a uh, great, perfect sacrifice, a blood sacrifice, and Cain brings, in the NLT says, some of his crops. So vegetation, fruit, things like that. So um, Abel brings a animal sacrifice, and scholars say that, that Cain brings a grain offering. So one's an animal offering, one's a grain offering. And, and there is this belief that, yes, that could be the reason, is that Abel brought a more acceptable offering because he brought a better gift. But that's not necessarily consistent with God because some of us don't have all the stuff and the best stuff to bring to God, okay? And Cain may not have brought his best, but it doesn't necessarily mean that God wouldn't accept a bird versus a lamb, okay? You follow me? God accepts whatever we bring. So what scholars believe is it was a matter of the heart. Because again, if someone's poor, they can't bring something as lavish as someone who is, has money. And God doesn't do that. He doesn't show favoritism based off of what you own. He looks at the heart of man. And so we can see here that, and I wanna give you, um, I wanna give you what someone said, not me. The Apostle John gives us, and I, well, this is scripture. Uh, the Apostle John gives us more insight into Cain's heart. He says in 1 John 3, 12, do not be like Cain who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. So whatever Abel did that was righteous in God's eyes, we can't necessarily pinpoint it on how good his offering was compared to Cain's. God saw something deeper and we don't have that in the text, in the scripture. So sometimes we read too much into that scripture and we shouldn't. Uh, its acceptability was not simply that he made a blood offering and a valuable offering, the firstling of his flock, but also that he gave a sincere offering. And this is what R. Brown says, Abel offered a pure heart as well as the best gift. God sees not only the value of the sacrifice, but the heart of the giver. 
And what we see here is an actual first fruits giving. And some people still practice this, where at the beginning of the year, they give an offering to God of some sort. The beginning of the year to say, thank you, God. What they're doing here is they're bringing the first fruits of their of what they do. So Cain was over the land when it comes to vegetation and fruit, but uh, Abel was a shepherd. Okay, so they, they both brought it, but in God's eyes, the one who truly worshiped was Abel, and then we know that Cain's heart wasn't righteous because what does he go and do to Abel? Kills him. Out of jealousy and anger, he kills his brother, and we have the first murder in the Bible. Of, of a person. And so, what, what's the lesson here for us today? Well, we can appear to bring an offering of worship or service to God, but God sees and knows our hearts. He knows whether our worship is from the heart or it's a show to keep an image or whether we are serving him or for our own glory. But know this, that God wants your heart. That is acceptable worship. You may not have anything to bring God today except maybe a broken heart. Bring it to God. He wants to touch your life and heal you. He wants to mend your brokenness. Maybe you have thanksgiving, but don't thank yourself for doing all the hard work. Give glory to God. Bring your heart to God. Like, be real with him and worship him from your heart. If you can't sing during a service, then give him your heart. Whatever it may be, and it's not just, we always focus on Sunday mornings for some reason, but God wants your worship every day. What will you give him tonight? What will you give him tomorrow? I can tell you this, my friends, he wants your heart. And when he has your heart, you'll give him your life. And then lastly, we see here that faith is belief that God exists, that he created the universe, or faith that he created the universe, faith to worship him with an acceptable offering. Okay, again, you have to believe that God exists, you have to believe that he's there for you to even worship him and seek him like, like Abel did. But then we have Enoch in verses five and six, and let me read it to you just to remind us of what it says. It was by faith that Enoch was taken up to heaven without dying. How cool would that be? Kind of weird too. (laughs) He disappeared because God took him. For before he was taken up, he was known. How cool would this be to be known as this? A person who pleases God. And in the Old Testament, it says that he walked closely with God twice. How beautiful is that? Now, this is what it goes on to say. Anyone who wants to come to him must believe that God exists. Now, that seems so elementary and foundational, and that's what I'm trying to say. We have to believe that God has created the universe, that God exists, that he is to be worshiped, that he can be sought after. And this is what pleases God, and it's impossible to please God without faith to believe he's there. God is pleased with Enoch because he believes he's there. And then God is pleased with Enoch because Enoch wants to be with God. Because God longs for a relationship with you, my friends. He longs to be in a relationship with you. And someone who believes he exists will seek after him. Who wouldn't? Think about that. If you believe the God of the universe exists, Don't you want to know him more? And that's why Enoch was commended. Now, we don't know why God took him before he died, but we also know Elijah, or he didn't die. Uh, We also know Elijah was taken, right? In the chariot of fire. Some people believe that Enoch and Elijah will be the two witnesses in Revelation. We're not too sure. Someone will find out eventually. But... It's an amazing thing that God has taken him and he commends him for his righteousness. Now, I want you to notice something real quick. Notice the stark contrast that the author has given us. We have someone who pleased God through a worship offering and then he's killed. But the word says that his life continues to speak. It continues to teach us how to worship God, okay? 
Then we have a guy who pleases God and he doesn't even die. Death, eternal life. But both are with God. So we may die before Jesus comes back, but you're still gonna be with God when you believe in him. Amen? Amen. But if we do not die before Jesus comes back, we get to be with him as well. What we're seeing here is the end times right here in this scripture, an analogy of that, which is pretty cool. But there's something I wanna make sure we take away today. It'll be on the screen for you. A life of faith matters when you are alive and after you die. You see, Abel's life is still speaking. What kind of legacy are you gonna leave for your kids and your family and friends? Will your life continue to speak faith that God exists and that he should be worshiped? Let it be that, amen? Let it be that people know, wow, that guy, that, that woman, that lady, they loved God and they were willing to die for God or they died going went to their grave believing and worshiping God. It matters how you live because even how you live will still speak to people after you die. What does it mean to walk close to God, to have fellowship with him? Uh, to walk close to God means to live in righteous fellowship with God. And I wanna clarify, it doesn't mean perfect living. But to live righteous is to choose righteousness over wickedness. And Enoch was commended for walking closely with God or walking a life that God wanted him to walk in. So that encourages us that the righteous, that's why I titled this message, the righteous live by faith. The righteous believe in God. They seek him. They walk with him. In fellowship with him, they worship him. Enoch's faith reminds us that all of life belongs to God. And our righteousness has to extend to the whole of life. Those who possess true faith walk with God day after day. Isn't that true? Every day. Belief in God's existence means a commitment. This is important. I had to read this a few times to really make sure I personally as well Believe this and live this way. Belief in God's existence means a commitment to his presence and involvement in every part of our lives. Those who seek him in everyday life can testify to his goodness. Amen. Why do I say that? Because that last verse, verse six says, anyone who wants to come to him must believe that God exists and that he rewards those who sincerely seek him. Him. When we seek him, he will bless you. He will show up in your life. You will find out that God is there and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him by faith. So let me close with this. A relationship with God begins by faith or with faith and continues by faith. We learned today the foundation of faith is that we must believe God exists, that he created the universe, he created us, he's the creator of all things, that he can be sought after, that you can pursue him and walk with him and that you can worship him. And we do all that by faith because you still don't see him, but you have felt him and you've seen him work in your life, haven't you? You have seen the evidence of God's hand on your life. You see the evidence of creation as we learned in Romans chapter one, that all things you know, point to him and to his existence. <clears throat> but I don't think it's a mistake that the author begins this chapter with faith that believes God exists, believes in God to seek him and offers a life of worship because God wants to be in a relationship with us more than anything else and it begins with faith that he exists and rewards those who earnestly seek him. What good is it? What good is it to say, 
that God, I trust you. I trust you to take care of everything in my life. I trust you to provide. I trust you to protect. I trust you to deliver on your promises. Can you really say that if you don't have a relationship with him? Do you really believe that? Do you really know that if you don't know him personally? I would say you don't. I would say it won't take much for you to begin to question that God is there or not. It won't take much, it won't take many trials for you to begin to question if God cares because you really gotta get to know him in a relationship with him and seek after him to really see he is who he says he is and he will do what he says he will do. So faith takes a relationship with God. It does. Back then, it was faith in sacrifices that brought their forgiveness as they sacrificed animals. Today, it's faith in the sacrifice of Christ. It was an animal sacrifice then. Today, on the other end of the word, the gospel, it was the sacrifice of Jesus that gives us forgiveness and begins a relationship with him. Now, that would take a whole sermon in itself, but I want you to understand that it's not by your works that you are saved. It's by the work of Christ and what he did for you on the cross that you are saved now. Amen. Amen. So we'll get into saving faith more, but here's, here's the invitation today. Uh, saving faith is to believe in the work that Jesus did for you. And then from that, we can begin a relationship and begin to trust God to do everything else. He did that. He accomplished what I could not do on the cross, so we know he's gonna do the rest. And by the way, it takes faith to believe all that, doesn't it? It takes trust in God. So today, I, I'm, I'm gonna give an invitation for salvation. So if you would, close your eyes, bow your heads, and. It may be you I'm speaking to today that God is really speaking to today. He's drawing you to himself to, to let you know he is alive. He created you. He exists. And he actually wants to be in a relationship with you. I, I teach this. God is not hiding. He doesn't hide. He is there. You can see it in creation. You can hear it in his word. You can sense his spirit even during this message that God is there. He longs to be in relationship with you. You must believe that he exists for you to believe in Jesus Christ too. But we believe in Jesus Christ that what he did for us, the sacrifice he made with his life covers over our sins and forgives us and gives us everlasting life. And you receive that by faith. So today, if that's you, would you do that? Would you say, I believe today? I put my faith in what Jesus did for me. I believe that his sacrifice has paid for my sin, has paid the forgiveness, the penalty, and everything for my sin, and that I'm forgiven. Today, you have to believe that too. You have to believe that you're forgiven, that he has accomplished it for you. And the word says that you will be saved that you're no longer your old life, you're a, you're a new creation in Christ. The old is gone, the new has come. And it will take faith to continue to grow. It starts with faith and continues with faith to grow from that babe in Christ, that little newborn in Christ, that faith that's new to a mature faith that can trust God to deliver. So Lord, I pray you would do that today as people are putting their faith in you God, I pray they would just say it from their hearts, from their lips themselves, that they confess you. I confess you as my Lord and Savior. I believe that you died. I believe you rose again and give me eternal life. I pray that in the name of Jesus. And if you prayed that today, we really want to know because we want to help you. And we also want to help you know your next step is water baptism. We want to explain that to you. So if you could, there's blue cards in the pews that you can fill out before you go. Give it to an usher, leaving your pew if you want. Why don't we stand together as we pray for us as a church to persevere in our faith and trust in God. As we go into this series of Hebrews 11 and 
by faith. We're gonna, we're gonna get into some things that are gonna make you start to really go, ooh, God's asking me to trust him, isn't he? <laughs> I hope to help apply it to your life. God is asking people to do things and it takes faith to see them through. So I pray this series will build your faith. Church, for those of you who have already prayed and believed in Christ, now we step out in faith and follow Christ. And that takes faith. Lord, I thank you for this church. God, we wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for faith. Faith in you. We stand on the shoulders of those who believed in you. We have sat in the sacrifices of saints who have sown into this church, not just money, but invitations to the lost, befriending and loving those in our community and leading them to you. God, it's the sacrifice that we can give you is our lives, a life of faith. Lord, I pray we be strengthened during this series, that Lord, that we would continue to trust you in the midst of every trial and every season of waiting. Increase our faith, God. And Lord, we learned today that even faith takes obedience, that your faith invokes obedience to you, to step out and believe. So God, we do that with every area of our lives. And Lord, we believe you exist. We know you created the universe. And God, you long for worship, but you long for a relationship with us as well in that worship. So God, we come running after you. We pursue you this year. We seek first you above all else. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen.